Good morning. Oh, I'm on. Wonderful. Well, it's great to be here with you to be able to share. I was interested to know how uh, David was going to introduce me after he introduced Rawl as his favorite speaker in the world. <laughs> the, uh, I asked him, I said, so <laughs> that makes me the hope for your second. He said, no, that would be Tony Clark. He said, I, I invited you here for contrast so they would appreciate the other men. So... <laughs> well, walking worthy, if ever there's a time for a discussion on this, uh, for us as men, as the body of Christ, whether as husbands or as fathers or friends or neighbors or just as human beings as men, and Paul, I've heard we're all just so wonderfully addressed that who we are day in, day out, wherever we are, uh, to be men, and uh, we're living in a world, obviously, that is struggling terribly uh, with matters of even how to walk, no matter where they are. And, uh, but it's something that's a great exhortation in the Bible. It's not new to us, and it's not something just necessary in our generation. It was a problem in the first generation, uh, in the early church. Uh, Paul, of course, is your, the theme here uh, today for Ephesians 4.1, where, you know, Paul, he says, I'm a prisoner of Christ. I belong to him, lock, stock, and barrel. I, I'm, I'm his bond slave, he called himself. They're fully given over there, but he said, I beseech you uh, there as men that you would walk worthy uh, of your calling, your vocation our, our, that, that we have now been brought into in Christ, uh, uh, wherein you're called. He tells the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, uh, and be strong. I like that <laughs> Quit ye like men. It's an old uh, English. I think a lot of people think today it means quit being men. <laughs> you know, the, it literally, there is such a weird thing going on in our society that if you're a man, you should be embarrassed about it somehow or another. That uh, uh, you need to get in touch with your feminine side or something like this. You start hearing this crazy stuff. I don't get it. You know, I mean, you, were, you, know, you, you need to get in touch with your, your feminine side. I have no desire to get in touch with my feminine side. I have no, I've never thought about that. I don't want to get in touch with my feminine side any more than I want my wife to get in touch with her masculine side. I'm not interested in it. Yeah, but but it, if, if there's anything that's needed in the world uh, today, it's men. And, uh, and if there's anything that's needed in the church, it's men of God. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, uh, Paul writes there, and he says, Therefore, my beloved... Brethren, he said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And I just want to kind of give a little bit of a, of a rush through a book. It's a dangerous thing to attempt to do, but through the book of 1 Corinthians. So if you're there, uh, we're going to kind of just swing through it a little bit. Paul, as he's coming to the end of Corinthians, he tells them on a couple of occasions there, he says, he says, you watch, keep your eyes open, look around, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. He looks at them and he's looking at the men in the church, he's looking at the men for leadership and calling them out into that role. And, uh, and in 58, verse 58, he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, as I said, be, be ye steadfast, unmovable, uh, uh, you know, there and always abounding. And to back up a little bit, here when you would look at the church, this is first century, first century church, of course, and uh, when you look here, it's, it's, it's in Corinth, and as you may or may not know, Corinth at the time was a very, very important city of Greece. It was the capital of a Roman pre uh, province there of Acacia, and it was very strategically and ideally located there It kind of the empire's uh, trade routes, travel routes, went from east to west. And uh, it was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. And Corinth was noted uh, in the world at the time for its commerce, its culture, and its corruption. And uh, everyone in the world at the time knew, the known world around, knew of what they called the Corinthian girl and, uh, the, and the Corinthian feast. It was uh, basically just a time of, of just throwing themselves into luxury and license, and uh, it was the capital essentially there as well of the worship of Venus. And uh, a lot of the mystery cults there of Egypt and Asia were there. And the, the temple there boasted of having a thousand prostitutes. 
And it was just kind of almost like the Las Vegas of the day. And it just boasted in its immorality. It prided, it, it pushed it out there. It wanted everybody in the world to know, if you want to come for pleasure, you want to come where there's no rules and anything is. Uh, my wife and I once said, well, we're, we're not home an awfully lot, but when we are, we'll watch these fixer-upper shows. <laughs> we're kind of addicted to them. Just, I don't know why. You can just turn them on and space out or something and watch, you know, or, or, they're, or they're buying house and they're moving here. It's just kind of that channel just has all of these things. Well, we're watching it uh, last night, and now it came up three or four times, uh, an ad for Las Vegas, one I've never seen before. I don't know they just came out with it, but it ends up with these two women running around having a wonderful time in Vegas, and then it ends up the little ad there with one of them proposing to the other, and there's a secret wedding all of a sudden prepared. The people jump up, and these two women give a quite passionate kiss to one another, and they say, in Vegas, join us you know, and just inviting there, the world. Uh, you, you have no morals, you have no values, or you're, you know, just come here, you'll have a pleasurable time. And, uh, and that, was, uh, that, that was Corinth it, uh, it, it, uh, in spades at the time. It's just the way that it was. And here, uh, the sad thing was, is that the church at Corinth, rather than it changing the culture, the culture had infiltrated the church. And, uh, and the church was in uh, dire straits, to say the least. When you would look at this, I just want to give you a quick rundown of the issues going on within the church at Corinth at the time. And uh, for one thing, they were very distracted uh, because of their immaturity but, uh, and their identity struggles. And uh, Paul writes in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 11, he said, It's been declared to me concerning you, a brethren, that those of Chloe's house, that there are contentions among you, and now I say that each of you says, well, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, I am of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? But one of the, the things there, just of the immaturity of the church at the time, is that they were connected to people. Uh, there were ones there that they looked there and, and they identified with personalities, not with spiritual life so much, but just the people that delivered the message the way they liked it the best. That, uh, yo, I'm a Paul, you know, <laughs> you know, that guy, he's just so clear on things. Or, oh, Apollos, he is the prince of expositors. He, he's, he's a preacher boy, that guy is. Or Peter, you know, he's just a wonderful fellow. And, uh, or others, well, I, I'm, I'm of Christ myself. You know, I'm just a plain Christian. But they all, but it was said in, in a way there that just paraded almost these things around. But they were babes in Christ. Paul tells them straight out in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, I, brethren, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you are not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. And he says, for are you not still carnal? For where there is envy and strife and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? He looks there and he says, you're, you're, you're just living like this natural, unsaved, mere men, natural men. You're not spiritual, you're carnal, you're natural, you're behaving just as if nothing had ever happened in your life, as if no spiritual change had occurred, as if you were not born again, you didn't appreciate being born again, you, you didn't appreciate the new life, there was no transformation, there was no need to transfer. After all, you know, I'm a saved person now, when the role is called up yonder, I'll be there, I'm fine. And yet now I can just go on living how I was before. I can just carry on because I, I'm, I'm, I'm saved. And I got my ticket to heaven. And that seemed to be all that was at all important to them. Paul did tell them in, uh, that, that they were saints. They, you know, he looked there. He didn't argue whether you were born again. That was never the argument of, of a spiritual person. It's never an issue. Are you, are you a saved person? Primarily, it's, now if you are saved, are you enjoying it? Are you living it? Are you walking worthy of it? Because from that point on, as soon as somebody is, is born again, now a whole, a whole new project begins. I've got 12 grandchildren, one great-grandchild and another one on the way. And that's wonderful. But the moment they were born, I mean, all the way through the pregnancy, it was quite exciting, quite wonderful. But the moment they were born, the project, that, the pregnancy ended, and a whole new project began. Feeding, changing, burping, doing everything you possibly could to try to get them to mature. To get them, you know, up to a week and a month and a year and two and five. And learning to walk, to talk, 
learning to, to, to mature? For, are they acting their age? Are, are we watch them, you know, and mothers are always concerned there with a the child. You know, my, my child is two years old, but I look at other two-year-old children and, and their, their mannerisms, their behavior, their awarenesses, you know, are beyond my child. What's wrong? And they want to go to a doctor. They want to have somebody look. Is there something we need to do that's not right? A good parent does that. Well, so also in the body of Christ, we, we, we look there, and is somebody there? Not, not, not you, or are you saved? But now because you are saved, are you growing? Are you maturing? Are you somebody that 10 you know, years later, <laughs> you're still wrapped up in the same things, the same struggles, the same immaturities? And it ought not to be so. Paul says you're acting like mere babes. You're living like it. They also had terrible moral problems, which obviously little babes do, you know, uh, but uh, in, in chapter 5, he says, it is reported commonly that there's fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles, uh, and that one should have his father's wife. Are you not puffed up? You should, have you not rather have mourned that uh, this who has done this deed might be taken away from him among you? Here he says, here you've got a man who is openly living with his father's wife, presumed to be a stepmother, the way that it's recorded there. But here, you, you know, it's just the guy's coming to church, she's coming to church, they're carrying on, oh, well, they're, they're getting the word, uh, we, 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 we believe in friendship evangelism, maybe a little by little something might happen with them, and yet here, as this is carrying on, no change, nothing happening. He says, are you not carnal? It's interesting, back in chapter, uh, uh, when, I, when I mentioned there in chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, are you not carnal? For where there is envy or strife or divisions... You know, in the Greek language, and actually between Greek and Hebrew, there's seven different words for, uh, for love. They're very, uh, the languages are much more descriptive uh, than we. We just use the same word for love. You know, I love my dog, I love my wife, I love my car, I love hot fudge Sundays, I love my job, I love, you know, watching football. I mean, those hopefully are a little different loves. You know, hopefully the way that you love your wife and the way you love your dog is, is a little different. <laughs> you hope for that. <laughs> you know, some guys, some men are oftentimes wondering, I don't know who loves me the most, my dog or my wife or something. And he, by the way, there's a very easy test for that. If you don't know, uh, when you go to work tomorrow or Monday, uh, just lock your wife and your dog into the garage at, uh, when you leave. And when you come home, see which is the happiest to see you. <laughs> and uh, you'll know. <laughs> But anyway, that had nothing to do with my message. I don't know where that came from. But anyway, but the thing is, is here Paul looks at them. He says, where, but in the Greek, there's actually, there's a word that you're familiar with, agape. It's love without discrimination, a pure love. Then there's phileo, where we get the word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Then there's another word, eros, and, uh, you know, which describes a, a sensual love, a sexual love primarily. But actually, and people say the word is not in the Bible. Well, it actually is in the Bible. It's, it's, actually in, it's in 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, and he says, where there are, are envy and strife. That word strife is the Greek word Aaron. And, and here, Aaron is a baby's love. It's a selfish, immature, sensual love. It just, whatever it sees and it has an appetite for, it wants it. Doesn't care where it came from, who owns it. Is it my wife? Is it my neighbor? Is it, you know, like pornography as was just being shared? There's something about every, all, 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 you're all sensual. We're born sensual. God created you sensual. And uh, it, it's, it's a part of our design. And, and God loved to do it that way. When God put Adam and Eve in the garden, the Bible says they were both naked and they were not ashamed. There they were, you know, if they, they had this unashamed, a love, it was a pure love that God had given them to you. Be fruitful and multiply. He noticed she was beautiful to look upon. He, he had a desire for her. God created that. The world didn't do that. The devil didn't do that. But when you and I come into this world as fallen men, born spiritually dead, we still have that, that sensual nature about us, but the fallen nature, the natural man, has no discrimination whatsoever about it. It just looks anywhere, and anything it's attracted to, it's just attracted to it. It doesn't care anything about it. It's just, is it attractive to me? And in its heart, it can go ahead and take it. 
That's why Jesus said, if a man looks at a woman with lust after, he's committed adultery in his heart. <coughs> it's already occurring there within him. Uh, there, maybe the opportunity hasn't presented itself yet, but the internal mechanism to provide opportunity and desire is there. But it's only the spiritual man that looks there. I mean, I, we all have, if you're, if, if you're a natural man, you have a natural desire. Now, maybe some of you, you're here and say, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. I, 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 don't, uh, I don't have a, any sensual desire for women at all. Well, God maybe have given you the gift of celibacy. God bless you. I don't have it. I really don't care to have it. But I'm, if you do, God bless you. I've <laughs> <laughs> been married 50 years, and I'm quite happy. But the, uh, you know, with, with, but it's something there that with it, when you, uh, but uh, with that uh, appetite, that with that desire that God, if, if either, either is giving you, you don't have it, which makes you a celibate, or you're, or you're lying, or you need to see a doctor, I guess. I mean, in the sense there, what it comes down to. But I mean, something there, God, but, but the natural man can't distinguish between the natural mind. I can go out to dinner with you and, you know, and David and Rawl and whoever, and we can sit down, and, you know, David can order a prime rib, Rawl can order a steak, somebody else can order salmon, I can order a hamburger or whatever. I can sit there and look over at the, at the, the salmon or the steak or the prime rib, and I can't tell the difference. They all look, I could, hey, could I have a bite of that? Could I have a bite of that? Could I have a bite of that? It's all attractive to me. I, you know, I, I, my flesh can't distinguish. And also the same thing on the physical level. I can look around and see, you know, there's about three billion women running around the world. They're not all ugly. And the, uh, <laughs> but, but there's something there. <laughs> I wasn't trying to be funny. I was trying to be nice to the other ones, you know, or something. But the... Uh, but, at any rate, but, but in terms of looking and seeing, but, but of realizing there, but the spiritual man can look there and discern. The spiritual man looks there and says, but that's not my steak, that's not my prime rib, that is not my, leave, that's on their plate. This is what is on my plate. This is what God has given to me. This is what belongs to me and where my affects and my desires to be. And tragically... You know, at, at Corinth and the rest of the world, because they can't discern, they can't distinguish, they're still babes. They just see what's on anybody's plate, and if they want it, they go get it. And, you know, and so here there's a thousand prostitutes down there, and they don't, well, hey, they got to earn a living, you know, or whatever their excuse <coughs> was for in the process, but something there that is a babe. But the tragic thing that has happened in our world today is many men, because I just heard a little bit of the testimony shared, pornography has invaded the world. And all that pornography is, is, is sex by proxy. It's sex in your heart with, with all these other plates that's just put out there. And, and then the tragedy of that is that now the marriage bed is defiled. Now you've taken somebody into your bed. There, and, and, and in your heart, you're intimate with, and, and now you've defiled the, the, the love that ought to be pure for, your, for you and your wife, that's shared there between the two of you. It has now been defiled. It's been corrupted. One time I was counseling a man in ministry, not a senior pastor, but in ministry, who was leaving his wife. And finally, it came out during the conversation that he had said, well, you know, he admitted that one of the problems was, he said, well, actually, I haven't slept with my wife in 10 years. I said, well, that's a problem. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. I've slept with her all the time, only it hasn't been her. It's been another woman all the time. It's a secretary or it's a you know, woman in a church or somebody else here or somebody there in my heart. So I figure if that's how it's, what's gone on for 10 years, why not just go find them? You see, that their, their, their marriage bed is defiled. If you've allowed your marriage bed to defile, to be defiled. It's, it's a natural man's thing that we all understand naturally. But the spiritual man looks there and puts an end to it. He realizes, I'm forgiven in Christ. I'm cleansed with Christ. And there I can look at somebody else and say, well, that's some man's wife. That's some man's daughter. That's some man's neighbor. That's some man's sister. That's somebody else's, on somebody else's plate, not mine. And therefore, I, you know, I want to, the affection that what God has given me to build that. Well, they didn't know how to do that at Corinth. So in chapter 5, 
There it goes on, and he says, I've written to you, you know, not to keep company with a man that's called a brother who's a fornicator, covetous, idolater, a railer, a drunkard, an extortioner, you know, such a one not to eat. Uh, therefore, put your, yourself away from such wicked people. Here is Rawl shared earlier there that we're, we're sons of righteousness. They we're sons of holiness, as he mentioned there. And as he mentioned, holy, is, it means it's set apart for sacred use. The day that you were born again, uh, you were to be set apart. Now is set from that spiritual womb, in effect, there, and be dedicated and offer a little child for spiritual use, for spiritual purposes. And they, now there's nothing wrong, you know, with, with having friends and neighbors and people that you associate with, you know, and to one degree. There's two different things that are in, going on in life and ministry, one of which is, uh, is, 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 is fellowship. And when Paul says, don't have fellowship with the world, the word fellowship means they're to share in common, to share in common. A lot of you men, maybe you go to work and you've got all these men you've worked with. And, you just, and, and when people are sharing with what they have in, with what they have in common, and if you're, if you're sharing in common with a man who only has the world, all of his jokes, all of his comments, all of his interests, all of his discussions are all worldly. That's all he's concerned about. That's all he knows. And therefore, all you have in common with him is your old life that once connected with that and laughed at that and enjoyed that. Well, if you try to have fellowship with that, all it's, all it's going to do is bring you down. And it won't bring him anywhere. Now, the other thing is ministry. Ministry is there where somebody there doesn't code to, 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 to share in common. They go there now to be poured out, to serve. They go now, I'm not here to, to get from you. I am here to specifically pour into you. In a loving, kind, patient, gentle, long-suffering way that maybe with people that you live around, you work around, but God, give me a way that I can pour into them without receiving back from them. That's what Paul called ministry, his service for Christ, his witness and his testimony. And it was obviously incredible. Everywhere he went, cities were turned around by him. You know, uh, there, and what an incredible ministry he had. He knew the difference in, between the two. And when, I'm, when I'm, I, I fellowship within the body of Christ, and outside of it, I minister. I'm poured out into it. Next thing you know, in this church, they're, they're, they're babes. They're carnal. They're, they're, they're living sensually and sexually. There's immorality. They're puffed up. They're within them. There's drunkards, there's fornicators, covetous, idolaters, you know, extortioners, you know, they're within them. They're, 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 they're suing each other in court. Chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Dare any of you having a matter against a brother go to the law before, uh, before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world and if the world be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge in such the smallest of matters? He says, you're not getting along, and so what do you do? You go out and get yourself an attorney. And, and, you know, and, and, and what, what, whatever the argument is, now, there's obviously problems within the body of Christ. We're all human. We all have our struggles. We all have problems. We can have them with each other, and we can hurt one another. We can offend. We can stumble one another. But here the body of Christ is a place where people can now go and sit down and say, talk to us. Help us resolve this. The biggest question of all of our lives, our eternal damnation, has been solved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps there you can help us solve a rather small problem compared to that within the body of Christ. They didn't know this. And they can't keep their bodies pure as a result. In chapter 6, verse 12, he says, all things are lawful. You know, not all things are helpful. And he goes on, he says, he says now the body, it's not for sexual pleasure and immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And he says, How do you, he says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot and with one body with her, for the two, he says, shall become one flesh? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? You were bought with a price. Glorify God. Here he looks at her, he says, Are you unaware? That when you go down to the temple or you pick up a prostitute, that you just, you, you, that the two should become one flesh, you just married her. That's what, that's what marriage is, the union of two bodies. And he says, you just, you just went down. Man, now, maybe you weren't planning. I, you know, oh, I, didn't, I wasn't divorcing my wife. I wasn't marrying her. 
I was just simply having sex with her. I was just simply a one-night stand. You know, and, uh, you know, it, the, uh, I, 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 I don't know anything about her. I, 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 I doubt if her name was really Poopsie, but the, uh, I don't even really know her name. I don't know <laughs> Republican, Democrat, Independent. I don't know where she lives, what she does. I just know the moment's pleasure I could get. But Paul said, you married that woman. You broke your marriage. Vow. You didn't, oh, you didn't divorce your wife, but you did. You separated yourself from her and united yourself with another. You've been bought with a prize. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. What are you doing? And it doesn't make any difference as far as God's concerned, whether it's you know, a literal transaction that has occurred there bodily or it's one that goes on within the heart. One of the things that is just so incredible today, you can't go anywhere without sex selling. Everything is about sex. Uh, almost, I mean, so much is at any rate. It's just sex is around, it sells everything. I, when my, my undergraduate degree was in business, and I really took a course in marketing, and way back in the 60s, one of the things that we did is, uh, I had to study General Motors. In General Motors, what they actually did, they went out and then they studied s- selling, and they discovered sex sells. And so they wanted to sell a Chevy. Well, they went out and realized, well, what you got to do is you go get that Chevy, you know, make, you know, wax it, make it look pretty, nice, brand new thing. But then you go put it on a cobblestone driveway with a beautiful U drive around it in this beautiful lawn and this beautiful stone house with, you know, with ivy growing up the side of it. And you have some, the door open out of the front door and some sleek woman come out and just slide into the car as she goes in there. And all of a sudden you're sitting there saying, I want a Chevy. You know something, I always loved Chevys. I, I, I didn't know that before, but it just clicked within me. I need a Chevy. And I mean, that's something that it sells. There's an appetite, a natural appetite, and the natural man feeds upon it. It humors them. It entertains them. It's powerful. It's a drug. They, they, they're coming out now with all these you know, statistics on how it is more addicting, perhaps, even than many drugs and on how powerful it is. God designed it to be so precious and so wonderful and so pure and so holy. By the way, if, you've, if, if your marriage bed has become undefiled, the wonderful thing is the blood of Christ can cleanse you. You can put all of that away in your heart and say, God, from now on, whenever the enemy tempts me, I want to be able to look and say, it's not mine. It might be attractive. It might be a you know, beautiful person. None of my business. I have my plate. And God, as soon as the enemy does that, I want you to just right there speak to me. Help me. Bring me out of this. I want my bed pure. I want it, you know, my marriage to be pure. I want my heart to be pure. As a result of this, you know, the church in chapter 7, divorce is rampant within it. People are, you know, they come to church, they find, you know, this nice Christian woman, nice Christian man, their husband or wife is not saved, and therefore I forget them that are getting divorced. And Paul says, what are you doing? When the world, what knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife, or what knowest thou, woman, or whether thou shalt save thy husband? Go minister and pray and wait upon God to heal and to save this relationship. See what he can do. Wait upon him. Chapter 8, they're fighting with diets and what foods are acceptable to eat. Some people, because they had been born and raised and around a lot of idolatry and where, you know, all this, meat, this, this food that was offered unto, you know, idols and gods and goddesses, now they felt, well, the food's contaminated. And oftentimes you could buy that food much cheaper than you could food that had not been offered to idols. Now, Paul could look there and he says, hey, there, there's no problem with the meat. No problem with the meat. But if it stumbles people, don't let your liberty... But they were just having that liberty. In fact, I have a problem with that. I, you know, the, uh, I like meat. Sorry, I like meat. I, there may be, there's some vegetarians among here. If you're, God bless you. That, that's fine. Personally, I wish you were all vegetarians. The price of meat would just drop big time and I could get a lot more. But, I mean, but now, but I shouldn't let my liberty stumble you. There is something there within it where we look in life in the things that, that, that with one person, there that we want to see it, uh, you know, that your, your liberty, that you don't allow these things to stumble another person. 
But as he's going through all of this, and he's just getting this litany of, different, of problem after problem, you know, in chapter 9, they're arguing of over payment for people in service and in ministries in there, and he, and he tells them, he says, hey, well, you know something? You don't muzzle the ox. If somebody serves, you, you, you take care of them. In chapter 11, while they're celebrating communion together, some of them, there they, they would come at these love feasts and bring in a lot of food. They were rich and wealthy. They could lay out this big old picnic back. There's the poor people over there, didn't have too many things, and they're actually coming in, flaunting this. And then during the love feast and the communion, they're getting drunk at communion. Can you imagine here? I mean, there's going people flaunting everything, and they're having you know, communion, getting you know, drunk there within it. And he says, eating and such, do this at home, have whatever you want there. But that is not the way it is within the body of Christ. You're aware that here you are around all sorts of different people. And maybe, you know, you're able to afford a life and a lifestyle that's way above other people around. Don't flaunt it. Don't stumble people that they end up, you know, they're envying you. And they're, you know, in, in chapter you know, 12, they're arguing and fighting over the greatest of spiritual gifts. Who was the best? Who, you know, what, what, which ones were necessary? Which one's worse? And he points out there that there's two great problems within the body of Christ that so easily happen. That is, the foot would say, because I'm not the hand. The foot's down here and says, you know, I'm not the hand. You know, I'm not necessary. And, uh, you know, and, and one body part, you could imagine. <laughs> you know, I could understand that. You know, my, my feet. You know, I, the, uh, and it's a miserable life being a foot at least on my body, you know, or whatever it is. It, it, you know, it, 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 it maybe it can have a nice night. It can have a nice night, but one of the very first things that you do is when in the morning you stick a sock on it. And then, then if that's not enough, you, you, you put leather all around it and tie it up tight and just say, just shut up and do your job. You know, <laughs> wherever I want to go, you get me there. And, uh, you know, with it, and, uh, and, and it looks at the hand. The foot looks up at the hand and says, look at the hand. The hand, it, it goes out, it reaches, it shakes, you know, things, it's, Look, I'm not, I, I'm not necessary. You know, and how that one body part, but even the hand can look at another part, the eye. Well, I'm at the eye. Wish it was an eye. When people shake hands, what do they do? Their eyes, they look at each other. Hey, hey, I, I'm down here. I'm doing the shaking. Hello. You know, more attention, I'm, no matter where you are. Or else the, the more important part that it thinks is more important looks down and says, I have no need of you. There, I'm sure that there's many men here today that you're sitting here and say, you know, I don't think I'm necessary. I don't think I'm necessary in the body of Christ. Nobody's really ever asked me to do anything. Never really had any role of prominence. That's insane. That will not hold water before God. God looks at you and you are as, as important a part of the body of Christ as anybody else in it. And in a sense there of just saying, how can I serve? Where am I? You know, I was offering my life, my service, on how it ought to be for every one of us and the way that we ought to be living our lives. And here, of course, tragically, in chapter 13, they had forgotten love. In the midst of all of this immaturity, all this junk, all this, this, this stuff, they'd forgotten that love was the greatest. Chapter 14, they're having terrible times there in their, their, their services there, all sorts of confusing displays, you know, of gifts. And people would think, you know, they're mad if they came in and watched all this. And Paul is just looking at this church, you know. And, and I mean, you, some of you may be born and raised or around different churches that could be a mess. You know, I've been with Calvary Chapel in 1971 when there was just one, and now there's 1,800 around the world, ministries of one form. And uh, we've, had our, we've had our problems. But I'll tell you, I've never seen Corinth yet. <laughs> I mean, when you look at one thing after another, after another, after another, after another, it just makes, if I, if I was called into a matter like this, I would just, <laughs> I had to get out, just, uh, you know, if one of my family members or somebody went to, a, to Calvary Chapel of Corinth, I'd say, just get out. <laughs> just get out. <laughs> I wouldn't even know where to start with that thing. You know, some, you see some of these, these uh, you know, programs where somebody buys a house, you know, for a rehab or 
fixer upper or whatever else, and they buy it. And every once in a while, they'll buy one. And as they start getting into it, they discover the foundation. Everything is a mess. It's rotting all over the place. They got termites and the plumbing shot, electricals in. And all they can do is just doze the thing down. They just have to just get, it's a tear down entirely, start all over. I mean, it's like I, you look here, this is like a church, you just say, just tear it down. And yet Paul looks. Paul looks at this thing, and he says, be ye. When you're all sitting there at Corinth, you're saying, what a mess. What am I doing here? I don't know how to handle this. Paul looks there, and his answer to them, you know, instead of being disgusted and distracted and confused or just washing your hands of the thing, he turns to him and he says, be ye steadfast. He looks here at the men. He looks at them and, he, and, uh, and realizes there that the first thing that it's going to say, you want to fix this thing? Paul says, all of this incredible, we can fix this. It starts with the men, and it starts with the men being steadfast. Now, there, as I went through the Greek on this thing, there's a couple of allusions. They're close to each other. But one of it is that this word steadfast, it alludes to a, to a, a, a statue, like a marble statue that somebody, you know, has made. They're this just steadfast. You just look there at like a statue of David or Moses or some, you know, marble character or something. This just fixed. It's just solid. And that's the way one translator looks at it. Another one looks at it and says it's actually a wrestling term. And, uh, and it's a term there that it's, it has the same suggestion to it. But one of the things in wrestling, I did a little bit in high school, I was never very good at it. But one of the things that, that the coach, will, if, if any of you are wrestlers and took it seriously, I'd, I don't remember a lot of it, but I remember one of the primary things that they did is as a, as a wrestler, he puts one foot in front of another, another behind it, and then he spreads them out. You don't stand there with your feet together. If you're going to wrestle somebody, say, come at me. You don't just stand there and gazing off. You put one foot up, you put one foot down. You bend at the waist, you bend at the knee. And then you're constantly, you don't just stand there immobile, you're, you're constantly moving around. You're waiting for a blow to come at you from any side so that immediately you can react, you can duck, you can move, you can lean into it. You're ready to go forward, back, or anything. You're living with, with this idea of preparation for a blow to come. You're looking there to say, I am in this thing, I'm in this fight, and I'm in it for the, it's the most noble, wonderful, awesome fight in the world. It's eternal. It's lies. It's awesome. You know, you look here at this last session. In a spiritual battle that, I mean, I don't, obviously, I didn't know the name of one that came forward, but I tell you, the Lord Jesus knows that not only the name of every person that stepped forward, he knew the number of hairs upon their head. He knew them when they were in their mother's womb. He knew he wanted to call them today. He knew the battle they've been in for many years over their life and their soul. And he knew people loving and caring and praying and helping them come to this day, like he did with every one of us. And there, somebody was steadfast. Somebody is behind this sort of a thing. People just don't get saved just for the fun of it. Or just, it's, 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 it's a spiritual warfare that goes on. And behind it, there, there's people that look, and you, know, you, you look, why does a place like this exist? Why has it gone on for years? Why are all of you here? Why have some of you loved and adored and worshiped the Lord Jesus Christ for decades now? And, and yet, at the same time, as the testimony earlier of, you know, you know, one of the staff here, and I'm sitting there listening to him, and I thought, as he's going through it, you know, he walks in the back room, and he goes in the bathroom, and he says, look out, he's going to steal the toilet in there, you know, or something there. I don't know what he'll have to. The old life could come back, you know, if he comes out with a big white porcelain thing, that's a hint, you know, but, the, uh, but here, but have God take somebody's life, transform it out of being on one side of eternity, bring it into another side of eternity, stand there and now go back and get others and bring them into it. That's somebody that's learning to stand steadfast. Somebody there that they find themselves that they're in it. That's steadfast in their life, in their walk. We're all hit that so clearly. You know, we're living in a day and an age right now where we're watching the world fall apart. The world's fall apart. 
in so many, many ways. You know, it's interesting right now, I'm, I'm not sure, I am not a politician, nor the son of a politician, nor care to become one, but the, uh, it's interesting. Right now, some people are going, oh, well, right now, unemployment, they say, is at the lowest uh, uh, in history or recent history. And, uh, you know, with minorities, it's the lowest in all recorded history. They're saying here we're, you, North Korea might be coming to the table. Iran is kind of being dealt with. And uh, economy, I saw an article this morning, it's, it seems unstoppable. And yet at the same time, while all this supposedly is happening, I think there's more stress in the world and struggle than there's ever been. There's more struggle, even though while everybody, well, we should be happy. Well, a lot of people, they're saying, you know, this, we're still right on the edge of who knows what. Who knows what could happen? The people are looking over at Russia and China and, and, and also you know, here, you know, there's, there's something like 450 volcanoes on the, what they call the ring of fire where, you know, that's going, where it, and over approximately 90% of earthquakes and volcanic activity is on that. By the way, it runs right outside, right here on pipeline. The, uh, the <laughs> San Andreas Fault is right, I was looking at a map. It's as you go out of the street, go slowly. Don't, it, the, you, you can trigger it. No, I don't know where the, I'm just kidding. I don't know where it is, but anyway. <laughs> But we're looking at a world that's falling apart. And in the process of it, God is looking for men that get all that, that get every bit of it. I see the political world. I see the moral world. I see Corinth. I see, I, I see the worship of Aphrodite and Venus. I see they're the junk. I see the trash. I see all the arguments. I see the pettiness. I see the image. I, I get it. I get it. And yet they are ones that long to be steadfast. All the more reason. Here, Paul says, be ye. Because you want to say, well, what do I know about it? Paul says, I'll tell you, be ye steadfast. And then he goes on and then he says, be ye immovable. Steadfast and unmovable. And you know, this is an interesting uh, way that Paul has written this. The Greeks, when they would write, the word unmovable is actually a different word than steadfast, but much the same. And when they take two Greek words that are approximately the same and they couple them together, it is for intensity. It's like when you and I, you and I we may say to somebody, as you're, you know, you're, you know, your kid's going out the door, some say, be careful. And then you may say, well, look, be very careful. But then you stop them and wait a minute, be very, very careful. In other words, there is something here. When Paul says this, he is adding intensity. When he says, be steadfast, Unmovable. The word there, unmovable, much like the word steadfast, but it means firm, fixed, stable, unmoved. But it's a stronger expression than steadfast. And you see, you can have something that has been uh, determined to be steadfast, but not know if it's unmovable. There's a difference between the two. My great-grandfather, uh, his name was John McClure, he was actually vice president of Southern Pacific Railroad, oversaw most of the railroad and a lot of the tunnels for railroads, California, Arizona, and Nevada. His brother was a man named Wilbur Fisk McClure. And uh, maybe have any of you ever heard of McClure Lake? You ever been to it? Nobody. Well, <laughs> you got to get out. <laughs> I've never been there either, but it's actually the largest earthen dam <laughs> in the United States. And it was engineered by Wilbur Fisk McClure, and they named it after him. He was also chief engineer for the state of California, oversaw a lot of construction. The major thing that he did is that he was part of the construction of Hoover Dam. Now, if you know anything about Hoover Dam, it's quite an interesting thing. They had attempted five dams before this, smaller, all of which failed. But here, Hoover, during the, the New Deal, they called it, and trying to tra help the American economy, uh, they decided that they wanted to build a dam, and uh, that it was needed, and so it employed uh, thousands of people when they did this. But here, when they built this, it's an interesting thing, because when, they, when it was completed, it was considered to be the greatest engineering feat in the history of the world. And just some statistics on Hoover Dam is 726 feet high, 1,044 feet wide. It is 660 feet thick at the base. That's over two football fields at the, uh, at the base. It's 45 feet thick at the top. 
and it took four and a half years to build. It has 4.4 million yards of concrete in it, which is enough to put a two-lane highway from the east coast to the west coast. At the time, they had never used any, this is far more material used in this than had ever been used in anything in the history of the world. And, uh, and here, when they built this thing, behind it was what is Lake Mead. A lot of you have probably been to Lake Mead. It took six and a half years to fill Lake Mead. It's 589 feet deep at its deepest point. It is some 247 square miles in size. It's 110 miles long. Now, the interesting thing about this is when they built it, because it was actually, another thing that's interesting, it was originally named Boulder Dam. A lot of people think there's a place called Boulder Dam and another place called Hoover Dam. They're one and the same. When they built it, because Hoover, President Hoover, got the money requisition and put, led this thing, they wanted to call it Hoover Dam. He said, no, call it something else. I don't want it named after me till we know if it works. We've had five that fails, and no man wants a broken dam named after him. And so they, they called it Boulder Dam for years. And then they wanted to wait until the water rose. They wanted to know not simply was it steadfast, but the issue was, was it immovable? And so for six and a half years, they watched the water level go from 50 feet to 100, 150 feet, 200, 250. As they're metering it, the engineers are studying it, watching it, looking for any, any instability as the pressure rose, 200, 250, 300 feet. 400 feet, four, higher and higher. As the water rise, the issue wasn't was it steadfast, but how much pressure could it take and stay in place? What could, what could it resist? How much could come up against it before it blew? And here when Paul, when he says, be steadfast and movable, there he is looking there at the same sorts of things that not just simply a dam goes through, but every child of God. How many of you know that we're born again and kind of grew for a certain period of time, but then as, as the first wrestling match came along with the enemy or with trial or temptation, they were flat on their back, you know, for the you know, three count, and they were out. How many do we know that got dragged away and beat up because they wouldn't plant their feet? They didn't, they didn't just casually just walked into the world. And they could just turn on and watch anything they wanted to watch, and they could go where they wanted to go, and they could hang out with whoever they wanted to hang out. And, and then they're shocked when they fell. Well, so what happened? He was such a wonderful Christian. He was in church every Sunday. He, boy, you should have heard him sing. He had a great voice, that guy did. You know, or whatever else. But meantime, the way that you, when, when the guy went to work on Monday, his feet weren't planted. He wasn't going in there that was looking, realized, I'm walking right into the world. I'm walking right into Corinth. That's what they talk about, what they think about, what they're entertained about. The other night, my wife, you know, she said, can we go to a movie? We never, we just don't do movies much. And I said, sure, but, you know, pick one. She said, can, yeah, pick one. You know, unless there's something really out there that's really bloody and warfare, I mean, then you pick one, and I, don't, I haven't heard of any. No, I didn't say that. But anyway, I knew what you... Well, she had read a book, and she thought, and she said, well, there's a movie called The Book Club. And I think, it, and there was this really cute book that I read that was really, really interesting. I think this might be the movie on it. I said, it had chick flick written all over it to me, but I, okay. <laughs> I love you. Let's go. We go to the movies and we go and walk in, you know, and here it had all of these aging, you know, actors and actresses of, you know, of, you know older 70s, you know, that are now kind of looking for a movie to do or something. They're not at the heyday anymore, you know, of it. And so they're all in this kind, kind of a neat list. Well, we get in there. We hadn't been in there five minutes. The vulgarity of it, the insinuation of it. Just within that, we're both looking at each other and thinking, what are we doing here? We got up and we left. And then I said, wait a minute. I go back to the place. I said, you know something? We just walked out of a movie. My wife thought it was, it was this nice, entertaining chick flick. It was vulgar. It was vulgar. And he said, well, we're sorry you didn't appreciate it. I didn't appreciate it. And, uh, and I said, and also do other things. I'm a Scotsman. I want my money back. And uh, <laughs> I don't want to support your thing. And so they actually said, well, we don't do that, but I'm real sorry that you're unhappy, and they gave us two free tickets for, some, for the future. But I said, well, I'm not going to sit there and take this stuff in. Now, the world, it makes stuff entertaining. It makes it fun. It makes it all. That was a great line, you know, meantime, while it's, 
it, it, it's just drawing us. What's your drug? How do you respond? You know, when it, somebody turned to me, they told me about a movie that they thought, it was a great movie. You've got to go see this movie. Now, it's got one part in it. You know, it's got, a, it's got some nude scenes in it. You just got to fast forward through it. Oh, do you? Well, I, my flesh. I'm an old guy, but I still have flesh. I'm sitting there, somebody, you know, I may okay fast forward to it, but I'll still sit there and go, <laughs> you know, type of thing. There's still what's going on there. What am I missing? You know, something. When you just sit there and realize, I don't want anything to do with it. I want to grow old with this woman, her, her alone. And when somebody looks there and they're going to protect themselves and care for it. And then he goes on and he says, now he says, now you're steadfast, you're unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. He looks now there, this person, they got saved. They're in the body of Christ. There's problems in it. Now he said, you be steadfast, you be unmovable, and now get in the hunt. Join the battle. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, if you go Google, I did it, <laughs> Lake Mead. You Google Lake Mead, that's, that's, the, that's behind Hoover Dam, obviously. That's what it was created. Hoover Dam created Lake Mead. And it has all of this endless vacation packages, fishing, swimming, boating, water skiing, jet skis, house boating, virtually anything that pertains to water or fishing or boating, above it, below it, snorkeling, whatever else you want to do, boating on the thing, uh, hotels to hang out at, all of this. Incredible amount of entertainment. You know, they're 200, or 110 miles deep, 247 miles, and then just filled with all sorts of entertainment. But you know something? That is not why they created Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam, I've been to the base of it. Down underneath it, there's 10 acres there, uh, you know, below ground of 17 generators. When they created this thing, the reason that they wanted it to be steadfast and movable is that they wanted the absolute maximum amount of pressure that could be driving these generators below, that could give them such thrust that would turn them around so powerfully with the amount of pressure upon them that they're out of that, it would generate over 4 billion kilowatt hours of energy. And with that, 56% of it goes to California, 25% to Nevada, 19% to Arizona. And it lights up and empowers cities, business, homes, family. The reason that it was created, that something would be steadfast and immovable, is that it would bring light where there was darkness. And lives could be settled in and transformed. That's why you're alive. That's why you're here. And to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. And you know, men, in closing, there's, I'm sure, I mean, I, I don't know you, obviously, but I wonder how many of you, God has taken your life, you're saved. You've got a testimony like we've already heard in one way or another. You've got something that God has done within your heart and within your life, and, you, and, and it's wonderful. God saved your marriage, working within your family, your children, your grandchildren. They've got a grandpa that loves them, shares Christ with them one way or another. You've got somebody there that now you're steadfast, you're immovable. Now, maybe some of you here, you're, you look, I'm a Christian, but I'm not steadfast. A minute, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. And maybe some of you, you're, you're, you're steadfast a lot of the time but a certain amount of pressure, you lose it. You're not immovable. Or some of you, you're steadfast, you're immovable, and you're doing nothing productive. Somebody there that you could be incredibly touching lives, and you're not doing it. When I came to Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa back in 1971, there was a fellow, there was several of them, but one of them I'll never forget is Herb Corwin. He was an usher. 
And Herb was such a character because I, he'd look, hey, I think he's a retired banker or something. I don't know what it was. But he was the, one of these guys that he always, not a hair out of place, wore a suit, a tie. And this guy, I mean, he came there and he was an usher. And he kind of, you know, this was in the hippies and barefoot and, you know, and tank tops and all this other stuff. But Herb was one of these guys, kind of looked like the epitome of the establishment, sort of a retired guy. But Herb was always right at the center door in the back. That was his spot. There was ushers everywhere else. But Herb, he was somebody. When you came down there, Herb came up to whoever you were. And you'd have thought you were royalty. He walked up to you and with a big smile. Good morning. Is this your first time here? You're, oh, ho, ho. <laughs> you're going to have a wonderful time. Where would you like to sit? I've got, I've got the perfect seat for you somewhere. Now, if you're down front, you can just, you can get it all really good. Okay. he lead you right down in front. He, he, would, he, he would usher you with a, a sense of ushering. Like, you would think, you'd walk down, and he'd sit you down. How's this? Just for you. He made you feel like the most special guy in the world. It ought to be when people come. I imagine many of you are the majority, probably from here, maybe other fellowships around. If, I don't know what you're doing in your church, but if you're not doing anything and, you're, and God has done some work in your life, let me just put it blunt, you ought to be ashamed. You should, you should look there and say, God, I'm sorry. I should be abounding. Man, I may be old, I may not know what I'm doing or where I can do it, but I want to go to somebody who says, how can I serve here? What can I do? What do you need that you need somebody that's steadfast, that's immovable, that God's transformed his life, given him a wife and a side who loves him? Amazingly, I want to serve. That's what we should ask. Well, anyway, I want to pray. A all already wonderfully opportunity if you didn't know the Lord, to give your life to him. But maybe some of you, you look there and say, you know, I'm a Christian, but I don't know if I'm steadfast. I don't think I am. You, you, you watch me at work on Monday. If you were sitting there in, invisible watching me, I'm not the man there that I, I want to be. I want to ask you, if that's where you're at, I want to pray for you. I want to ask you to stand up. I want you to ask this, stand up. It may take more courage than you, it'll do, but if you can't do it here, you can't do it at work, I can assure you. If you can't take a stand there for the Lord now and say, here, I'm not the man at work I ought to be. I'm not the man in my neighborhood I ought to be. But God, I want to become that man. We're all hit at bullseye. And men, if that's where you're at, you stand. You stand. This is, I mean, all of us, if there's any, any nobody ever becomes, you know, steadfast and immovable by coincidence. It happens by choices and struggles. Maybe some of you, you're, you're, you're now, don't just stand, all of a sudden you're all standing. I, I don't know what I'm doing here. This isn't, I, I'm not giving anything out for free here, I assure you. I'm giving you a job when we're done here, somewhere in the body of Christ. Maybe some of you, you're immovable. You're fine here, but you go home and you can walk in the door, your wife can say something, then all of a sudden you lose it. Your kid can do something, you lose it. You know, around, and you realize God. I don't want to be that man. I want whatever it is that's happening here today. I want, I want something. And maybe some of you, you're saying, you know, God's blessed me. I'm steadfast and I'm pretty humble. <laughs> Not because of me. Like Paul, like Rawl says, I'm, I'm humbled by it. I can't believe God blessed me. But I'm not abounding in the work of the Lord. I'm not serving. I want to. I don't know what it means. I'm going to find that out. I want you to stand too. And we're going to pray. If there's any of you, you realize, I'm standing here because I'm going to find out how God wants to use my life. He's blessed me. He's saved me. My name's in the book of life. He's transformed me. And marriage, my whole incredible thing. And I'm not going to hide my candle under a bushel.